is default. Default is, um, um, in economics, we, we talk about default as just when people can't pay back their debts, and it's very, very common. Uh, in Ireland today, there are lots of uh, people can't pay back their mortgages, lots of small businesses can't pay back their loans. What I particularly want to talk about is, is when governments default, when governments can't pay back their debts, what we call sovereign default. Um, and I know that this overarching theme I, I was informed by Caroline was, 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 was predicting. Um, and I, I'm going to be a real economist here and start by noting that I was the only person who put a question mark on my one word title. Um, so, you know, maybe we will default, maybe we won't default, who knows, right? Uh, you know, There's the old joke about Harry Truman, the US president said he wanted a one-armed economist so that the guy couldn't say, on the other hand. Um, what I do want to emphasize, though, is that um, whether or not uh, countries will default is, is, is a tricky business. Um, and it can be a difficult thing to predict because one of the things uh, that makes economics so complex is it involves millions and millions of people around the globe interacting with each other in ways that are often difficult to predict. And often all we can say is that, well, what might happen is, 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 is multiple possibilities. You know, this might happen, and then the other hand, that might happen. Or it may be that sometimes both will happen. We'll see one thing and then we'll see another. So in relation to um, uh, sovereign default, um, you might start by saying, well, governments are much more powerful than than an individual business or somebody that owes a mortgage. You know, somebody owes a mortgage loses the job and they don't have the income to pay back their debts. But governments, governments have a power that, that regular people don't have. They, they, can, they can tax people, right? So they have access to, uh, 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 to your pockets and, uh, and to your bank accounts. And so in most cases you'd imagine, well, why would governments not be able to pay back their debts? And when you think about, most people think about government borrowing, they think about, uh, you know, the budget deficit. They think about, well, the government is spending more than it's taking in, and that's why it needs to borrow. In fact, in lots of cases, uh, when you see sovereign default, it doesn't actually have that much to do with how much the government is spending more than uh, it's taking in at any particular point. Rather, it has more to do with the fact that there's usually a large stock of debt that they're rolling over in various ways. So, for instance, consider a government that has uh, a debt GDP ratio of 75%. Right? So they've got a debt they accumulated over time, maybe through running very small deficits, but they've accumulated a, 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 a debt that's 75% of their GDP. And suppose they've done this by, on average, borrowing money for five years. So you borrow money from people, you say you'll pay it back in five years. Well, that would mean, on average, they'd have to pay back 15% of GDP every year, or have to, have to, to, to pay somebody back 15% of GDP every year, even if they weren't running a deficit. And that's quite a lot of GDP. You know, that's, that's quite a lot of money to have to, to put your hands on all in one go if, for instance, it turned out that nobody else out there suddenly one day was interested in lending you that 15% to pay off the last set of guys. And so you often have these circumstances where everything's going along OK, people think you're fine, people will lend you money, and then suddenly nobody will. And there's a bunch of guys you borrowed money from five years ago, and they want 15% of your GDP. And if you go and look for 15% of your GDP off your people, often, well, there might be a revolution, or you won't get re-elected, or lots of unpalatable things happen. And so in circumstances like that, often what happens is you turn around and say, well, I'm sorry, guys, from five years ago, but we're broke, and we can't pay you back. And actually, sovereign default um, is, is really as old as sovereign debt itself. If you look at the, the recent book that uh, Carmen Reinhart and, and Ken Rogoff uh, a roll call this time is different. You'll see all sorts of examples of uh, uh, from the early days of sovereign default when European kings used to borrow from Italian bankers to finance their wars. Regularly when things went wrong, they told the Italian bankers to go to hell. So the history of sovereign default, the history of sovereign debt in many ways is a history of, of, of sovereign default and a risk of sovereign default. Now, that doesn't mean that default is your only option when uh, when you run into trouble uh, and you're having difficulty paying back your debts. Um, as Reinhardt from Rogoff's book emphasizes, there's two major alternatives. Um, one is um, to not so much tax people, but uh, to make people that have money in your country an offer they can't refuse. Uh, what Reinhardt and Rogoff call restrictions on capital flows. Um, and you, see, you saw a lot of that in Europe, for instance, after the Second World War. Um, 
where countries had a lot of debt that they built up, banks were told, well, you have to buy a certain amount of government bonds. People were told, you, these, your, your savings options are limited to purchasing government bonds uh, and, and, and small amounts of other uh, options. So uh, in a world like that, the government is always going to have people that can lend money to it, because basically you're sort of forcing them. Um, beyond that, the other great option to avoid a sovereign default is to make sure that you owe people money uh, in a currency that you have control over. So, for example, when Ireland had our own currency, Irish pounds, we had our own central bank, our own central bank printed the Irish pounds, we owed you money denominated in Irish pounds, and we were having trouble raising them by tax, we could always put in a call to the governor of the central bank and say, Will you print us off a few pounds there, and we can pay this guy. Right? Now, in practice, it might work more like, um, uh, you know, instead that the central bank governor will print off some euros and he'll buy a new bond from you. Um, so those kinds of, of restrictions on, on, on freedom of capital and uh, being able to use your own currency and print lots of your currency, or perhaps maybe devalue your currency. Right? You could choose to devalue your currency. That tends to lead to inflation. And then because of, because of inflation, the government is taking in more revenues, and then the debt problem goes away. Um, you saw those options used a lot uh, in Europe, in post-war Europe, um, which, which brings us to the Euro era. So when Greece started to get in trouble a number of years ago, the reaction of the policy community, um, the policy leaders in Europe, was pretty much this reaction from Joaquin Almunia, who was the, who was, we all know Ali Rehn. This is Ali Rehn's predecessor. And Almunia said, no, Greece will not default. Please, in the euro area, the default does not exist. Now, in a way, that was a funny thing to say. Because if you go through our three options when you're in trouble uh, debt-wise, uh, default, restrictions on capital flows, and having your own currency, the euro took away two of the three. We don't any longer have control of our own currency. Like it as we might, Enda Kenny cannot call up Patrick Conaghan and say, print us off a few euros there uh, to pay off our debts. Um, uh, all of that is controlled centrally uh, through the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. And the European Union has rolled back all sorts of restrictions on, 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 on what to do with your money and capital flows so that government can't tell us all that you need to buy national solidarity bonds uh, and so on. All of that's illegal in the European Union. So that really left the third option, which is default. So you might have imagined that when the euro started out, that financial markets and people thinking about lending money to, to countries in Europe were going to be very skittish and going to say, OK, the other options are gone, uh, but there's going to be defaults inside the euro. And sure enough, there have been. Right? Greece has defaulted. Greece has had its debt restructured. People who loaned money to Greece were given back new bonds worth much less than the existing bonds that they had. Funny thing is, though, when the euro was introduced, pretty much the exact opposite happened. These different colored lines show the interest rates uh, that investors were paid on their debts for lots of different euro area countries. And you know, I've tried to do this. You know, green is Ireland, red is Spain, blue is Italy, whatever. But the thing you can notice is that going back before 1999, there was a big difference between all of these uh, interest rates. And that interest rate reflected what investors saw as, as risks. And the principal risks that they saw was that the countries could devalue or there could be lots of inflation. You might get your money back. You might borrow uh, you know, a million, uh, or you might loan the Irish government a million pounds, and they might pay it back to you five years later, but you might be able to buy as much stuff with it. And those risks were well understood and well priced in, and generally you'll find out that the people who had a lot of debt and were most likely to get into a debt problem had the highest interest rates. So sure enough, Italy were number one back in the pre-euro area. And what had happened during this period, I think, was it had been so long since there had been any sovereign default in any sort of advanced countries that people forgot their economic history and just thought, well, the terrible thing, the terrible risk associated with bonds has been that there could be inflation risk and there could be devaluation. And that's gone now. They can't do that anymore. Right? None of these countries can control their own currency. And so magically, between 1999 up to about 2007, the interest rate on in all these countries were able to, to, to pay on their debt was about the same. And actually, it was quite a self-fulfilling kind of situation. Because even if you were a country like Italy that had a lot of debt, um, once the interest rate fell from 14% you know, down to 4%, it's a whole lot easier to carry that debt. The interest costs on that debt every year were very low. 
So people thought that uh, the risks of, of, of uh, associated with the devaluation had gone, but then they also thought, these guys can pay all this. Then the Great Recession came. And then people realized, OK, well, these guys maybe are not doing so well, and they don't need to borrow more. And, and people started to think about what, what really happens in bad outcomes. And then they remembered that the European Central Bank were not going to come in and print money to bail people out. And they remembered that you couldn't just command lots of money. Um, and then eventually, unfortunately, I have to always leave Greece off this chart, because the Greek interest rates got so high, everything else ends up looking, uh, uh, look, look, looking tiny. But eventually, Greece did default. So where are we today? Are countries like Ireland going to default? Um, there's been some reaction to this. The European Central Bank now has a, a program that it's never used called Outright Monetary Transactions. Uh, some of you may have read in the newspapers the last couple of days. There's a, uh, a case in, in Germany the last two days where some Germans are trying to uh, 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 get this program, which has never been introduced yet, uh, declared illegal. Um, and that's a program whereby the European Central Bank says it might, maybe, possibly, under some conditions, be willing to print off money and buy a government's bonds if they do the right thing. So are there going to be more defaults in Europe? Well, I think the answer is yes. Because not, someday, people are not going to meet the criteria that the European Central Bank sets down for being willing to print off money uh, to buy their bonds. Is Ireland going to be one of those countries? Well, right now, the markets think not. There's been an amazing reversal uh, in terms of Ireland's debt. The, 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 the interest rate in Ireland's debt has gone from almost the top one in this chart to down below uh, everybody else. But I think the overall lesson you should take from this kind of chart is that in relation to sovereign debt, the situation is often more precarious than it looks. For a long time here, people thought everybody's safe as houses here. Then they suddenly realized everybody wasn't. We seem to be moving towards a situation where everybody's very reassured by this ECB program. Um, I, I am less than reassured. And I think that uh, sovereign defaults, if the euro is going to stay together, uh, probably sovereign defaults will be a, a, uh, a, a, an ongoing feature uh, in the coming years. And the question is, how do we deal with them? I'll leave it at that.